Well, we want to welcome you again to our, our baptism service this afternoon. Uh, what a privilege to be able to do this, to come together as, as the body of Christ, and especially after so long um, not being able to worship together in person, but to have our first uh, baptism service in, in quite some time. And so you know, we are here because of God's grace and the grace that we have seen God display uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. We see that Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. First Peter 3, 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and being made alive in the spirit. And so it's with uh, this, it's because of God's grace that we can, as uh, those who have confessed our faith in him, we know that we have the, um, uh, the imputed righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because of the truth we see in, in Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So with that, today we get to um, uh, have one of our, our brothers baptized. As Terrence mentioned earlier, from Romans 6, uh, the reason that we are baptized is uh, because of this call that we have to um, be baptized with Christ in death. Romans 6, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And that is what we have because of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he has risen from the dead. Verse 5, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might no longer, uh, might be brought to nothing rather, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin now if we have died with christ we believe that we will also live with him we know that christ being raised from the dead will never die again death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to god the reason why we practice baptism why that's important for us as a church to have this ordinance it is an issue of obedience as we see in in acts chapter 2 38 peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins so this shows that it's a personal association with jesus christ and it's a belonging to the church that's why we do this publicly and in the context of our church family. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 even says, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So that's an important element that this is a public declaration, a public confession, as we see in, in Romans 10, 9. And so with that, I'd like to invite Jason to share his testimony um, at this time. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give like a little background, and then I'll just start to move into the testimony. Um, yeah, so I was born in Taiwan, and I moved to California when I was five. I was raised by my Christian mom, who, as I grew up, adamantly shared the gospel with my dad, my brother, and myself. For me, I believed everything my mom taught me about Christianity, um, but it seemed that Christianity seemed to be only about the eternal life and the childish things kids wonder about in heaven and not anything before that. I had no concept of sin, what it meant to be saved, and life after salvation, but I would later learn of God's desire to give me a new heart. 
The darkest part of my life began when I moved to Shanghai when I was 12. I had always struggled to fit in and felt this desire to be liked by others. This desire manifested itself strongly at the school I attended. With worldly standards, I sought out cool friends and molded myself to become like them. What seemed the most important to me was to hang out with the kids who cussed the most, who gossiped the most, who partied the most, and it felt good. They accepted me because I was also like a punching bag for them. They constantly joked about me and called me names, but I didn't do anything about it. In fact, a part of me enjoyed it. I even made fun of myself and increasingly invested my confidence and my happiness and acceptance from friends. Senior year came and something happened that wiped away what joy and confidence that I had left. I suffered an open wound that wouldn't begin to heal until much later on. I realized that I felt an unnatural, obsessive attraction to a close friend of mine, a male. I was taken aback by my feelings and couldn't explain um, it couldn't explain them because I always thought I liked girls. All my life, I've been trying to be the same as everyone and blend in, but this contradicted everything I wanted to be. When he didn't reciprocate anything, I was heartbroken, and every single day I went to school, it felt like going to battle. Feelings of hurt slowly developed into a depression that seeped into every area of my life. This new revelation about my identity drastically depleted what feelings of self-esteem I had before. I stared in the mirror at myself as I always did. I saw thin wrists, chubby belly, and my feminine voice. I thought, man, I really must be gay. Then I saw my brother and how masculine and strong he was, basketball champion. I hated my life, laughing off jokes about my weight, people looking at my brother and asking if I was an accident, wanting to be attracted to girls but being attracted to guys. As my depression matured, I considered suicide daily and fell deeper into nightlife with my friends sprinting on a treadmill trying to find happiness through partying and alcohol, a happiness that seemed so close but always out of grasp. Later on in college, my situation had gotten better. I started working out and became more passionate about my work. Everything in my life seemed conquerable through discipline and hard work, everything but my struggle with same-sex attraction. It's beyond me to explain why, but I could never fully dive into pursuing a homosexual lifestyle. This suffocating feeling was the strongest on the night that I went to watch a movie with my friends called Moonlight. The movie tells the story of an African-American boy's struggle with bullying and same-sex attraction. Basically, the movie's message, along with the message of the world, is that I should just be myself, that I should embrace all the labels that the world would have me believe is my identity and find pride in them. The message made me a sitting duck. I felt like I had to make a decision now and choose. I could either embrace my true identity, submit to my desires and disappoint my family, or I could repress my true identity for the sake of my family and pretend to like women. These two choices gave me so much pressure that for the first time in years, after giving up on God, I pleaded and cried out to him. I told him I couldn't do this on my own and that I wanted to know if he was still there after all these years. I wanted to know if he still cared for me and I begged him to take my burden away. I just wanted to be normal. Miraculously enough, the night before the movie, me and my friends went to eat um, on a street near uh, the church I used to go to. Uh, we walked by a church called Korean Central Church, and I noticed it, and I thought maybe I should check it out. I thought I like Korean culture, food, and Korean shows, so it seemed perfect. That Sunday, when I dragged myself to church after watching that movie, my life was forever changed. I'm one of those people who can never really pinpoint when they believed in God, but I can say with full certainty that day, February 19, 2017, he changed my heart to truly believe in him and he welcomed me home. I finally understood all the worship songs that I listened to as a child and all the lyrics made sense to me. I felt Jesus pouring his living water into my empty depraved soul and telling me that this, that he was the answer that I've been looking for, a well of satisfaction that never runs dry. Thinking back, all the things that I've been through from a broken self-image to suicidal thoughts, it was all for the glory of God. In his infinite love and wisdom, he wanted to show me that my end is his beginning, and that there is no hope apart from the blood of Christ. It was through these times that God revealed to me that it was the gospel that I needed all along. The gospel has given me my new identity in Christ. It teaches me that everyone is a sinner. My sin of same-sex attraction is no different from the sins of others, not worse, not better, not special. 
The world will tell us it's special and reason that rather than fighting them, we should embrace them and we often do. This is prime time to embrace them and the times will only get better. But what Satan intended for evil, God used for good to refine me for his purposes, for his glory, for his kingdom, because his grace is sufficient in my weakness. After coming back to church, this is the conclusion I've come to and strive to live out. My identity is not in my sexuality, how I look, how I walk, how I talk, but in Jesus Christ alone. Whether he wants me to live a life single and celibate or with a wife and family, I know that God only has plans for my good and for my joy, not for sorrow, and that if I have Christ, I am satisfied. I know now it wasn't a matter of choosing between gay or straight. My only option now is to follow Jesus, and I'm fully guaranteed that this new identity that turns evil into good, wretched into clean, unworthy into justified will not forsake me. Looking back now, in the moment, I was overjoyed and thankful that God rescued me out of my suffering. But I understand now, and I'm even more thankful that he saved me from an eternity in hell. I'm so thankful that God sovereignly led me to a Bible-believing, Christ-centered, and gospel-centered church that didn't tell me that I was a victim to the world and to suffering, but taught that Christ was the propitiation of our sin, and I was the perpetrator in need of redemption and forgiveness. No longer do I feel a need to strive and work so hard to live with my sin and my shortcomings. I know Jesus died for me. And God, in his just mercy, sees fit to look upon Christ and attribute his righteousness to me. This testimony is definitely not an I made it speech. Far from it. I still have a long way to go, many battles I'm currently facing, and many more to come. Words of repentance will always be on my lips. I'd love to stand here and say that the past four years of walking with God have been a walk in the park. That I'm always on fire for God and that my old life is a distant memory. But those would be lies. These past four years have been tough, fighting sins I thought I've overcome, feeling Satan seek every chance to draw out my sinful desires, often refusing to put on the armor of God and wield the sword of the spirit. Even so, this is my blessed assurance. I know that my living hope is Christ, who is always interceding for me, that I'm always in the palm of his hand and I, that he is climbing this mountain with me, helping me to carry my cross. And not only that, but in these past four years, Christ has lovingly drawn many brothers and sisters to my side who are willing to run this race with me and not give up on me. I felt the comfort and the joy of being adopted into his church family so that I, now I'm the furthest thing from alone. And one day I will reach the top of this mountain where I don't have these burdens anymore, where I don't feel attraction to other men, where my delight in God will never waver again. In this climb, I've often been tempted to think that this testimony is a seal of my salvation or that it is those spiritual highs and experiences of being on fire for God that are sustaining me. I've come to see that a dramatic testimony does not save and that the fire I have for God is so limited. Only Jesus saves and only Jesus sustains me. I owe it all to him and I'm not exempt from working out my salvation with fear and trembling. Whenever I fall short of his grace and love, I remember Paul's words to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Jason, thank you for sharing your testimony of God's work in your life. Jason, because of your confession in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.